we have good material when we open up the Bible and use the Bible as the foundation for the message. Each one of those character portrayals uh, in their own way had a crisis of belief. Who do you believe? What do you believe? It's interesting this morning. We're going to use the account of the resurrection in John's gospel. If you want to join me, I'm going to be in John chapter number 20 here in a little bit. But I'd have you just uh, continue with our thinking of believe and, and the idea that every person here in this room has some type of form, uh, some type or some form of belief system. Uh, some would say, hey, I believe in Jesus. He is my Savior. He is the Lord of my life. Uh, he is my everything. Some would say, yes, I believe in the Lord as a Savior, uh, and, uh, but he really isn't allowed to operate in my life as Lord, but I love him. Some might say, hey, uh, bowing my knee and bowing my heart to Jesus, I'm just not there yet. I believe, but I don't know how far I'm going to take my belief. Well, that's the three people that we're going to look at this morning here in a little bit, which kind of aligns itself with looking at, again, some characters. And some of you that love getting into your Bible, character studies are some of the uh, some of the best uh, word studies and, and different scriptures and passages and comparing. And, of course, one of the sweetest studies is looking at all four Gospels and the harmony of them all and how they all work together. To believe that the Word of God is true. To believe that Jesus Christ is God, the Son of God, the Son of Man. To give credit upon the authority or testimony of another. That's the word believe coming from the Webster's Dictionary Back in the 1800s, the old Noah Webster, to have a firm persuasion of anything. In some cases, to have full persuasion approaching to certainty, and in others, more doubt is implied. Understand this morning, that as these, this production team, the actors, the, the singers, the worship, all, all the voices that are proclaiming this message, they believe in what they're saying. They believe in what they're singing. They believe in what they are coming forward to convey to you. That's the Holy Spirit of God inside the believer conveying that message. Now you say, can someone who's a fake and a phony do that? Well, sure they can. There can always be a place of lying, lying to God and saying, I believe in something and then behind the scenes, you don't really believe. You don't really believe and you're really, truly someone that is fooling all the people in the room. But guess what? We can't fool God when it comes to really what we believe. Believe, to expect or to hope with confidence, to trust. You see, today, as we think of believing and believing in something or someone, I, I wonder this, if you would just simply just, just agree, I, I would think you would, that everyone's looking to believe in something. Everyone. Everyone's thinking today, I need to believe in something. But I would say this might even be a clearer place to make sense. Everyone is looking to believe in someone. You believe in something? Yes. Now here's, just think of these five characters. Pontius Pilate even said, hey, I got to a point where I really didn't believe, but boy, I could not dispel the effect that this man in front of me, Jesus Christ, had on everyone around him. Consider that Jairus' daughter is standing there saying, I've got to believe more than I ever believe that God is in Jesus and Jesus is God and my father, my daddy loves me. The person now becomes the focus. It's not just a something. So is it something or is it someone? Or is it both? Because some of you would say, hey, I, I believe in something. I believe in a lot of things. And sometimes I believe in people. And then others of you would say, it's hard for me to believe in people. I have a hard time believing in someone who's always going to let me down. I have a hard time believing in just culture and people and how they are. And, and uh, we're talking about to believe in who God is, who the Son of God is, who Jesus Christ is. So is it that we start out looking for something and it leads to someone? I think that's the way it goes. 
I think that's the way it really lays out because you and I think, okay, I'm going to find something. Well, I was looking for somebody or something to fix my arm. I wanted to find something that was better than what I was living. I wanted to be in a place where the God of baseball was not all there was to life. Just like all of you got to a place in your life where you said, hey, the God of ritual, the God of ritual, uh, religion, the God of just going to church stuff wasn't really my belief system at all. In fact, that had so many holes in it, and it was so light with any type of strength. So I really got to take it right here and ask you this simple, strong, direct question. I want you to ask yourself, who do you believe in? And why do you believe in that person? Why? Because we live in a time just like 2,000 years ago, just like hundreds of years before that in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, that people would say and have a testimony that they believed in all the things that God was doing. And then when it came time, in the crux, when it came in the time for the challenge, when it came in time for having that convergence at that four-wheel stop sign, which way am I going to go? People would backpedal and say, I can't believe in a someone who is God, if the something is going to be something that's going to fall apart. And therein lies the breakdown of everyone's faith. Do you really need to have God do something every single day? Something new for you when he's already done everything for you. He's done everything. He's made a way for you and for me. You see, faith is to persuade, to draw towards anything, to conciliate, to believe, to obey. It means this very simply, that faith and belief are very closely related. And the Bible teaches us, as was the verse that was conveyed earlier, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You don't believe on him as being God, the son of God. Believe on the, what he did as the payment of the de- and the death, burial, and resurrection on the cross, in the grave, in that glorious resurrection day. And if you do not believe in that solely and completely for your salvation, the Bible teaches that if your name is not written in the book of life, you will be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death and you for all of eternity will be separated because you didn't believe on Jesus Christ. This morning, there's a whole lot of different belief systems in this room. There's 150 people in the room, give or take. There's a bunch of people online listening, and all of you got to really say, what do I really believe? Yes, but who do you really believe every morning when you wake up, believer? What kind of belief system do you really have? Because as we've been preaching through already in the the study of Galatians, hey, there's a lot of conflict that's been going on in the church for 2,000 years. And the church is made up of the body of Christ, which is the believers. But you're attending this morning, and you're in a different place wherever you are than the person that's right next to you. And that person that's right next to you is saying, hey, it's got to be something or someone that you believe in. That's all we're going to look at today is it's got to be something or someone. Now consider what I was saying in my introduction for a minute before we read John chapter number 20 in the first 10 verses. Last night, ABC carried the Ten Commandments. Everybody see it? Raise your hand, three of you. Gosh, you don't like watching the Ten Commandments? It's also biblically accurate. I still need to figure out how Charlton Heston does the two voices when that movie was made back in 56. How did they do that? The nation of Israel, discounting the whole idea of the Ten Commandments movie, was at a place, just like it is portrayed near the end of that movie, of being at the sea, wondering... How is God going to get us across? I heard that he was going to get us across. Now we're stuck and he hasn't done anything. What happened? I mean, we got the, the pillar of cloud. We got the pillar of fire. We've got this leading of God. We've got this guy Moses. And then they say in Exodus chapter number 14, 
As Moses drew nigh, excuse me, Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were so afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? They were believing in something. They were believing in some kind of cause, but they were not pointing to God. As Moses was pointing them to God, he says, Is this not the word that we did tell Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians, for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness? And you know what Moses did to respond? It's powerful. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And that's how they walked through. You see, they wanted to believe in something. By the way, the cause will break down after a while. But the creator of the cause, Jesus Christ, will never break down. And the answer of what it takes in Jesus Christ to have eternal life never breaks down. You call on the name of the Lord to save you, he will save you. He will forgive you. He will not go back. He will not pull back. He will save you, and he is the Lord of your salvation. Think of the goofy movie real quick, The Wizard of Oz. Because you see, the people in Egypt, they're thinking that Moses is just hollow and he's a good leader, but now he's not. And they think that God's not going to come through. But when they pulled back the curtain of that, God was standing right there. Wizard of Oz, a whole lot different story. Because the tin man needed a heart. Scarecrow, what did he need, a brain? Lion needed a little courage. Ah, yeah. And they get to Oz. Oh, they got the big image up on the wall, and they got all this thing. Ah, oh, mighty Oz. And then old goofy Toto pulls back the curtain. Ta da! What you believed in that you needed, the something that you needed, and even the someone that you thought you could rely on didn't even exist. I know it's a story from the 30s. But I wonder if we're living in some world where Wizard of Oz is somehow more a way of living and believing in a fake something and a fake someone. Believers, this morning I speak to you in the Holy Spirit, those that are lost, that are not believers or trusting in something other than the Lord Jesus Christ as a someone, please understand this. This is a time defining in the church history like I believe no other. It is so, and why would you just settle with the statement that, oh, I guess it's because we're Laodiceans. That is baloney. Oh, is that's just the way we are. That's baloney. We've bought into the idea that the something is more beautiful to believe in than the someone. And if you read Romans chapter number one, you'll figure out one thing, that the world that was lost believed more in the created things and the creature more than the creator. This morning, we're going to find three people that were believing in something. They were believing in an event. That's fine. The event of the resurrection is, woohoo! there's no greater event in the history of mankind than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it points not to the event as much as it's the author of the event which is God Almighty raising his son from the dead and him appearing before so many in those 40 days. John's account has some really neat things about three different people. Let's check them out. Verse number one. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher, seeing the stone taken away from the sepulcher. So it's a little dark, early at dusk time. What is the first day of the week? Sunday. What time Sunday start? 6 a.m. No, it starts at midnight. No, it doesn't. Chronologically speaking, the Jewish time, it started at 6 a.m. Now, as I said in the first service, my associate pastor do a whole lot better than this. But just remember this. The first day of the week is the resurrection. There's no way that Jesus Christ, in Good Friday, went into the grave on Friday. Unless you're really bad at math.
that behooves a little study for you because it's Wednesday. Wednesday into the evening. And as it goes into Thursday, Friday, Saturday, completes itself, 6 a.m. in the morning, up from the grave he arose. Do the math. Well, we're in such a stuck place of living in this Gentile calendar we live in that we've forgotten when we read the scriptures. Think of their time right now. Think of the text and the context of where they live. This is 2,000 years ago. It's Jewish times. So, Mary's there. It's kind of dark. It's dusky. It's in the the time of the year where we've got some big things going on. We've got Sabbath, we've got Passover, we've got Pentecost coming. Woohoo! It's good times for the religion of the Jews. And she runs down to the sepulcher. Do you see that? When it was dark and the sepulcher taking the stone away, she runneth, verse number two, and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. The disciple whom Jesus loved is? See, the nine o'clock service, they were more certain of. Now, this is on video. The, the apostle whom he loved was? Oh, you're such performers. Gosh, stop it. This is Jesus. Come on. But consider that the stone is rolled away because, of course, Jesus Christ couldn't get out of the grave unless the stone was rolled away. Ah, wrong answer. The stone was rolled away so they could go in. Come on now. Don't need to roll a stone away. Oh, gee, Jesus stuck. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Jesus, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get out of here today. Oh, gosh, I don't know. It's going to be really tough today. Oh, boy. There's so much that's going on in the resurrection story. Again, if you want to have a really sweet study, just check out the harmony of the Gospels and study it for a few weeks. It's awesome. And there's so much going on here. But in John's account, because John is the apostle who's giving an account, so he's got, like, hands-on stuff going on. It says they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. So, this is Mary Magdalene making this profession and clarity to Peter and John. Verse 3. Peter, therefore, went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulcher. And they ran together. Verse number 4. They ran together. I love this one. I love this one. Now, since, since Mark is here with you, Doc, I can say that he would have beat his brother. Because I told Mike in the first service he would have beat you. So, see, they're brothers in Jesus, you see. And they're not directly genealogically brothers, but just think. They were called out around the same time as a pair of brothers, James and John, Peter and Andrew. There's got to be competition all the time. There's got to be. There's got to be. Come on, are you kidding me? How in the world did the old man John beat Peter? Unless Peter was kind of maybe really big fisherman that was used to just. No, these guys were in great shape. It's just a fun thought to think. They were both running to the sepulcher because they had to get there. I hope at the end of the service in a few minutes when we have an invitation time that you'll run to the invitation time because of where you're at in your belief system and how maybe today it's a time of, hey, Christian believer, getting that, that belief system reset where you start believing more in the one who's of the word of God than just believing in something that might get you by today. It continues in verse number Five, he's stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. So John run the race, he beat Peter, it says there. He was the first of the sepulcher. He gets there, he stoops down, he takes a peek, and he goes, eh, eh, not going in. There's some good stuff to this. We'll see that in a minute. Verse number six, then cometh Simon Peter following him and says, get out of the way. I got to check it out. So Peter goes, into the sepulcher, and it says, He sees the linen, and seeth the linen clothes lie. Verse 7, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Now, that's no some shroud of something over there in Vatican that they're talking, they got the sinner cloth. That, no, 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 no. This is the napkin. That's a whole nother message for you. Go study out what that napkin means. I wonder who folded that napkin up. I wonder why he folded it up. You want me to give you a hint? That is a sign of his coming return. He didn't have a valet come in and fold it up for him. All the linens of his wrapping were on the ground. The napkin was steadied in a perfect spot. 
not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Woo, I'm getting the goosebumps. Okay, here we go. Verse number 8, 9, 10. Then went in also that other disciple which came to the first to the sepulcher. He saw, and he what? He saw and believed. What did Thomas say? Hey, blessed are those that have not seen and still believe. He saw that Jesus was not there. And so Peter goes in, John hangs out. Now John goes in, bam, we've got ourselves some really cool, good stuff here of three different people and how they handled this setting. Verse number 9 says, For as yet they knew not the church scripture that he might rise again from the dead. They just didn't know it. You know, know something, like really know it. They followed him, they heard it, they kind of were taught it, they believed it, but they did, but they, they didn't know it as it's being fulfilled right before the rise. Don't feel bad if you don't believe a lot of stuff or really know or have a handle on some of the things. Just keep after it because you'll know it someday. Because you'll be in good company like these disciples who were still knowing in that day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came, revelation came to them. Whew! And verse number 10 says, And the disciples went away again unto their, unto their own home. Now, as you look back up on the screen there and you say, Hey, I need to believe. These three were followers of Jesus Christ. Mary Magdalene, Luke chapter number 8, you go back and look. Miraculous, I think it's Luke 7 or 8 around there. Miracle that the demons were healed out of her. She followed Jesus. When you start out everything that happened in the resurrection time, there's Salome, the other Mary, Mary that's the mother of James, and then you have Mary Magdalene. There's a lot of people that have come to the resurrection not everybody, though, but a lot come. Then Jesus starts appearing. It says he appeared to over 500 in one setting. It says that he appeared to the disciples uh, 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 in the upper room. He appeared to them twice. Thomas wasn't there. The second time he was, he appeared to them in Acts chapter number 1 before he is taken up. I mean, all the accountings of Jesus Christ. In the 40 days of his resurrection, there's so much that's in play here. So I just want you to consider this for just a few minutes. Mary Magdalene. Peter and John, which way do you believe on the Lord? And how's that being carried out, like them or maybe some other? And then if you're lost today, you really have never believed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, then how are you believing from afar? Like, eh, I don't know. I don't know, because they followed Jesus. They knew Jesus. The first thing we got here is Mary Magdalene up on the screen. She was first to find out something, and she remained for hard evidence. Are you kind of like that? You love getting into the class, you find out something, you're the first person to find something out. Some of you are like that at church. You get to church and you're going, hey, I got here early and I found out that the coffee's not good today. It's not very good. So you start passing the word. Hey, Andrew, don't drink the coffee. It's not very good. It's not very good. But then somebody else will come early and say, hey, for the, for the first service, they came to the first service, and then the second service, people come and go, that message was terrible. That pastor, he couldn't preach his way out of a wet paper. I wouldn't even go to church. I, I think you turn. Some people like to come early because they want to know what's going on, but then they backpedal a little bit, and they remain until they get the hard evidence. I like Mary Magdalene because I put, up, put this up on, up on the screen for how she believed. She was inquisitive at first. She wanted to take a look. She wanted to see what's going on. She sees that Jesus Christ is not there. She goes back. She gets the disciples. She comes back. She's standing afar off. And don't forget, when you look at John chapter number 20, real quick, just a couple of little highlights for time. We can't go too far. But it says this. The angels, of course, in verse number 12, see two angels in white sitting in the, uh, one at the head, the other at the feet. Verse number 13, they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She said unto them, Because thou hast taken away my Lord, and I know not where they laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and not knowing it was Jesus. Whoa, I love Mary Magdalene. She's inquisitive, and then she steps back. She's asking, she's wondering. She goes, tells the disciples, and then she comes back and, whew, What did they do? What did they do with Jesus? And then she starts kind of going, Okay, now I have two angels talking to me, now I've got Jesus talking to me, but I don't know, is Jesus talking to me? Are you that way? God keeps on sending you stuff and showing you stuff and taking you stuff and you have some questions, but then you're meditative about things. Like, I really need to sort this thing out. That's good. 
That's good. That's a style of pursuing truth. That's a way of getting answers because I want to know whom I believe. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know whom I have believed. So if it's an inquisitive way, great. Meditative way to get into believing, cool. The second person up there is this Peter guy. Now we all love Peter. Don't we? I mean, and when we're having the bad days, we go, well, I'm going to relate to Peter. I mean, he's Peter the apostle. I mean, God started the church with him. I kind of am acting like Peter. Is that okay, Lord, if I can just justify my bad behavior like Peter? Because <laughs> Peter was kind of crazy, wasn't he? He's a little messed up. He did some things kind of, eh. He dove in. He's the truth speaker, seeker. He's the believing, he's the guy that's looking and saying, I want to find out what I really believe, and the way I'm going to go about it is to dive right in. I'm going to take every Bible class, every discipleship class, I'm going to take everything, I'm going to be everywhere, I'm going to take like five different classes, and I'm going to dive in and I'm going to look for answers. And I want to find the truth. I want to find the truth. This is the kind of person that Peter is. Maybe you can relate to him. He's aggressive and impulsive in the way he goes about believing. He's so sure of himself. The word aggressive in a lot of ways can have a negative connotation. But when you're aggressive, usually it's because you're sure of something and you go after it. Aggression, not so good. Aggressive, I know that stuff and I want to know more. And he says, I'm going to be all right. I'm going into the sepulcher. I've got to find out what's going on. John, you hang out. I'm going to see what it is. And then he's impulsive about what he's believing. We know that because just hours back, he denied Jesus Christ three times. He doesn't know that Jesus is about to meet him, though. Woo! And that's beautiful because it just shows who God is. Somehow he just gives you one more chance to repent, turn around and say, I believe in the wrong thing, Jesus. I'm going to believe in the right one, not thing. I'm going to believe in the right someone. That's Peter. And the third one is John. Third one's John. Here's this guy, John. Oh, now John, he... <laughs> He's the example, man. He, John's the example. He's, he's a good one, right? He's the guy that, hey, he had such closeness with the Lord Jesus Christ. We know the scriptures tell us that he put his head on Jesus Christ's heart. John ran to find out something like Peter did. He beat him in the race, but after, he, after that, he hesitated. He hesitated. He saw... Then he believed, which is so powerful. So, hallelujah, if you need to hesitate before you figure something out, fine. But keep on going. You see, don't, don't stop. You might have to have a Peter around, but you might hesitate and go, eh, no, 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 no. You've got to go look for yourself. You've got to go look for yourself. And you may end up believing. Believing on the one that was in the grave. This is the third kind of belief system or the way you go after believing, being perceptive and attentive. Is that the way you go about things? I'm going to perceive what's going on. I want to use some discernment from God. God, show me. I want to know what you see, and I want your wisdom to perceive what's going on. That's John the Apostle. You see, John the Apostle wrote some of the sweetest words you have in your Bible. And you read first and second and third John. You read this Gospel of John. Then, you, by the way, when he was a little bit older, like 90 ish, he went off to the Isle of Patmos and he had a peek into heaven with Jesus. He's perceptive about the heart of Jesus. And he's attentive to believe what God is doing. Holy, holy, holy God. Jesus Christ spoke of himself, and of course, John's the one who said it. So as you look up at this slide here, 
We all believe in something, but God made us to believe in someone. Jesus Christ said of himself, and if you want a really good deep dive study, go to investors because Doc is doing this right now. You know where I'm going. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Jesus Christ says, I am the light of the world. Jesus Christ says, I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the vine and I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's what Jesus says about himself. You know, there's one other bonus thing about the I am statements, and that's the fact that Jesus Christ says this in John 10, 36. Say ye of him who the Father is sanctified and of the world, thou blasphemest. Because I said, I am the Son of God. He said of himself, I am the Son of God. Of course, the scribes, the elders, the Pharisees, the chief priests, they mocked him when he was on the cross. And they come up and said, hey, you're the king of Israel. You're the king of the Jews. You said that you're the Son of God. Why don't you get yourself down off of there? That's in Matthew's gospel and the account of the, res- of the uh, resurrection, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, we all believe in something. Oh, the resurrection, that's great. That was a great thing. I mean, I believe in church. I believe in God. I believe in everything. I believe in blah, 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 blah. But I heard in the Bible the devils also believe in everything that God has done. But they tremble. So what is your belief approach? How do you believe? Any of those are great. I wouldn't mind jumping in on the followers of Jesus Christ model like Mary Magdalene, John the Apostle, Peter. Or maybe it's just how you line up with God's word and some of the examples in the word. And maybe you line up with King David and how he believed through all the storms. Maybe you line up with Joshua, be strong and courageous. Or maybe you simply line up with Paul the Apostle. No Christian follower of Jesus like him. You see, I want you just to park right here on this last slide as we finish up. You see, the someone is the one. The one. The one. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like him. There's no one like Jesus. And he is the one you need to believe in no matter what method you take, how you will go about it, and there's many others, but in those three characters and these five up here, today God's given you a great, great message. Not just from what I may have said, but what his word says and what the people up here have said, what the song has said about his love divine and the songs that we are sung. This can ignite you, believer, to make this day a defining moment. I'm going to believe in him.